My name is Addie. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of 1111. Welcome everybody. We're so happy that you're here on our first virtual like gallery show. Um, we're gonna play a, a short video about 1111 to give you guys all the context of who we are. So let's hit it. As I said, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Addie Gonzalez Renteria. Um, as mentioned earlier, I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of 1111. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our work, we are a nonprofit arts organization. We are based out of the Valley, but we work all throughout LA County. And our programs mainly consist of exhibitions, public art, uh, art education workshops, and event production, such as art walks and events like throughout LA. Um, I'm really happy that you guys are all here and excited to introduce our work to you all. Um, we're excited to have to be hosting this amazing show in our gallery. Um, as you can see in the background, I'm here in person live and excited to be here. Um, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. As I mentioned earlier, just keep yourself on mute um, while the presentation is ongoing. If you have any questions as they come up, uh, please input them into the chat box and we will get to them once the presentation is concluded in the Q&A uh, portion of the presentation. Um, and again, I'm gonna hand it over to Erin Renteria. She is also the co-founder and co-director and also our gallery director. So she's gonna talk a little bit about um, our gallery and then introduce our curators, uh, Suvan and Sandra. So thank you. Hi everybody, thanks so much for being here. Um, I wanna say first off, excuse me if I have to exit out of the shared screen here and there. Um, just if there's some glitches, I know we're all used to Zoom technical difficulties, so excuse me ahead of time if there are some. Um, I just wanted to thank Sandra and Suvan, the curators of the show, as many of you know, for such a wonderful show coming into Embed Gallery. Um, Embed Gallery is located in Chatsworth um, in the far West Valley. Uh, we are inside of a large facility called Toolbox LA. If you are unfamiliar with Toolbox LA, please um, you know, take a look, come make an appointment to see the show in person, and we can give you a tour of the facility at the same time. It's a wonderful um, co-working space, tech incubator, maker space, huge facility um, with artist studios, wood shop, metal shop, um, kiln, you know, all kinds of wonderful things for the art community in the West Valley. Um, again, this show is just, it came together so beautifully. Thank you so much, Sandra and Suvan, for curating such a thoughtful and timely show. I know so many of us, I should speak for myself, I have been feeling so much um, anxiety and tension and fear in so many different capacities of where we are right now um, in the landscape of our planet. And, you know, the thing that brings us together, the one thing that we have in common is the ground that we stand on, the world that we're in and what's affecting us. Um, so this show has just been such a pleasure to um, have up in the gallery to install and I'm so looking forward to hearing from the artists and meeting you all and hear, hearing from you all if I haven't already. Um, so without further ado, uh, Suvan Gear and Sandra Mueller, welcome and please take it away. Um, 
I really want to welcome everyone on behalf of both Suvan and myself, and also the Southern California Women's Caucus, who are one of the two uh, sponsors of the, of the event. Um, I'm really proud that uh, the gallery was able to get a, a very supportive grant from Department of Cultural Affairs in support of this concept, which they're going to keep going for another six months. So we're really pleased that um, this will have legs and it's all come together. It's actually come together on Zoom with many of you in conversations in terms of the artists. Um, and you know, it had we had our stop and then we did a check-in to see if everyone was good to go, if we could safely bring work, masked and all those good things. And the answer was definitely yes. And so um, just uh, at this point, um, the one other thing I would like to do before we do our land acknowledgement is just say in terms of the day for the conversations, um, each artist knows this, they will have two minutes um, to talk about their work or to, you know, whatever is coming to mind to them about the exhibition. We're not requiring that they answer the question we might pose to them. Um, and we're sharing the time. And it really is, this is a wonderful show that, that Suvan will give you a little bit more of an overview on the premise, but it just, we, we really set aside the categories. Often there's an environmental show that just fo focuses on the environmental works. There's shows that focus on identity. There are shows that focus that are abstract. In this instance, we really brought all of them together because it is the nature of the topic. So without further ado, and to really ground us in the space where we are today, I'd like to introduce Pamela J. Peters to give our land acknowledgement. Pamela, if you're... Okay. Um, as a Diné woman living here on Tavangar, it's important not only today but every day that we should acknowledge the Tongva people as the traditional land takers of Tavangar, which consists of the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern, the Southern Channel Islands, and make it a point to work with the Indigenous people in these places. Today and every day, let's pay respect to the Hovikiktam, the ancestors, and the uh, he he rom the elders in the e yo he kam our relatives relations past present and emerging the tongva people i feel it's important to acknowledge our tribal relatives homeland and i understand that we all of us are visitors here i myself as a native person am visited here on the Tongva people's homeland, as my homeland is in the Southwest on the Navajo Nation. So thank you, and please um, think about, you know, the lands that you reside on, which are the Tongva people. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Pamela. That's really an excellent way to begin. And it's my pleasure to introduce my um, creative cohort, <laughs> Suvan Gear and, and in the the you know we've had our conversations for the most part with the artists together and the wonderful um, experience I've had in doing collaborations of this sort and partnerships is that we are committed to the idea that we have our we each bring what we bring to um, to the experience and so we have wonderfully different approaches and skills and it's been um, a delight to work with my dear friend, Suvan. Thank you, Sandra. Um, is it switching over? Am I unmuted? <laughs> you are speaking. <laughs> okay, great, because I can't see me. All right, um, I just wanted to remind everyone, especially people who are kind of new to the exhibit, that the goal with Common Ground was to nudge aside our modern habit of thinking as na of nature and humanity as two separate things, forgetting that we are all on one planet. And we're using art with this exhibit to highlight our stories of division, separation, and all the other ways that we divide ourselves up, but also the story of what's happening to the earth. And it's to, really the purpose of this is to help us mend the broken connections that we have between ourselves and the planet so that we 
those things have put us on a collision course for our own future. And our hope is that more exchanges where we keep the big picture in mind might help people actually keep in mind one another and the larger good for seven generations and more. So uh, because we want to hear um, about the art, I'm we're breaking it into little chunks of different um, of the artists that are in the show. And because Sant Khalsa is um, going to run from this Zoom presentation to a series of Zoom workshop, actually, that she's part of over, uh, was, is it Joshua Tree? I forget. Um, we're going to take her first, and then we will go in alphabetical order through the rest of the uh, artists that are in the exhibition. So Sant, uh, my question to you is, as we're looking at this image, which has all five of the artists that we'll be speaking with, um, can you say why you said in your statement that the Holcomb Valley, where you did your piece about uh, the re, it's called uh, building air, making air. Growing air. Growing air, thank you, growing air. Um, why you called it a complex landscape? Oh. Hmm. I wrote a statement that's less than two minutes. Can I read it? And then maybe it'll make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then you can talk because you got two whole minutes. Okay. Um, my two photographs in the Common Ground exhibition are from my current photo project titled Growing Air. For Growing Air, I am revisiting the site of more than a thousand ponderosa pine seedlings I planted in 1992 as part of the reforestation of Holcomb Valley in the San Bernardino National Forest. The re reforestation project was intended to improve air and water quality and restore a fragile and vital ecosystem that was decimated by mining, clear cutting, and cattle grazing during the 1860s gold rush. That's sort of the complexity of it. Um, I returned to the site of the, plant of, of the plantings for the first time 25 years later in 2017 to find an extraordinary, beautiful, and thriving forest. I was fascinated with both what is visible and hidden, the hidden mysteries we seek to understand about trees and their co communal lives. I'm spending time in the forest developing a meaningful connection and producing works that respond to this unique and complex environment. I experience a deep and profound connection with this place and recognize the power and sacredness of the trees. I walk through the young forest attuned to the growing mycelian networks beneath my feet. I know that the trees are aware of my presence and I express gratitude for all they give us. These trees, like the millions of others that are being planted worldwide, are required to restore the breath of life to our dying planet. I believe that the awareness that we are nature, that we share the common ground of our planet can profoundly transform our lives. When we realize that the water in the rivers and aquifers in the, is the same water that flows through our bodies, and the air we breathe is given to us by the forests and plants on the earth and in the oceans, we become partners with the natural world and are grateful for the gift of life and live as conscious and compassionate beings. I guess for me, all life is very complex. And certainly um, the forest because of all the different stakeholders, which is of course us, the indigenous people who have been there forever, the um, wildlife that lives there, um, and, you know, this is an area where there's still people have interest in the site for mining, but we're dependent on these trees to provide us with oxygen, just like they're dependent on us to provide them with carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of complexity here. It's true. And trees are special to you. You've done a lot of work. Yeah, I've done a lot of work. Uh, actually, uh, Kim Abelis, who's in the show, and, and with my work next to her, which makes me so happy, was actually the person who inspired me to move in that direction through an exhibition she curated in 92 called Smog, A Matter of Life and Breath. And that's actually what um, got me planting trees and really thinking about um, the impact 
of ozone pollution on our forests. So I, I have lots of gratitude for, for Kim and thank you to you, Siobhan and, and Sharon for, uh, um, Sandra for inviting me. And uh, I mean, this is such an incredible show and so many amazing artists. And I'm sorry I can't stay for this. I'm in the middle of teaching a workshop. I have two computers set up right now and I'm watching what's going on over there. So <laughs> We're glad you could join us, really. Thank you so much, Sant. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we're gonna move now to Kim Abelis. That's her work there on the left at the top. And uh, Kim, um, can you talk to us a little bit more about the reasons you want people to think about this whole notion of a shared sky? Um, sure, and I wanna say to Sant, when I saw the layout, when you sent the images, I was the same way, I was like, Oh, that's so perfect that we're together because we do have a long history with environmental work together. So I appreciated that. Well, you know, um, the title of your show uh, relates to common ground, right? And then here I have these skies. So I love the contradiction and it really plays a lot to what these pieces are about. Um, it's part of a larger project that became a public art project at, in Koreatown at the YMCA. Um, I had asked people who I knew were traveling or people that I knew from other parts of the world if they would send me a, a sky and each of the skies actually has the name of the person. Some of them are artists, a lot of them are not, uh, but the person is credited next to their sky and also the location where they took it in the world. Occasionally it tells maybe a detail about um, something that's happening in the sky that I want to uh, you know, alert you to. Um, or maybe it's in somebody who climbed to Mount McKinley and took a, a sky photograph there. Uh, the thing is, you know, the sky is the thing we do share, thus the name Shared Skies. Um, and because I've listed the geographical locations, I really would like the viewer to think about this idea how we um, separate land by these boundaries, and yet the sky is really the seamless idea around the globe. And so in a lot of ways, I see this piece as really breaking those geographical disconnects that we have, you know, this uh, intense nationalism that is, you know, running rampant around the world. Um, that's in, in such um, a different attitude than the idea that the sky with its if it's clear, if it's polluted, it is really all related to us. Because after all, when pollution happens in one part of the world, it doesn't just stay there. It travels through the winds uh, and the currents. So um, anyway, I, I will also add to this that um, this was really, uh, from my point of view, this project, a um, community-based work so that Anytime somebody gave me a sky, what I did was I gave them a print that had 12 other skies and their own in the print. So those were then sent to the people so that they were always connected with 12 people they had never met before within that artwork. And I have to say I'm lucky enough to be one of the people who received a print and I love it. It, it is a wonderful way to connect with other people through art around the world. And you have a project right now that you're doing in your workshop that also connects people around the world. It's part of why you do this, I think. Yeah, I like these unexpected. What Sivan's talking about with Common Ground, um, uh, part of what I wanted to do was develop a workshop for people and I made an art kit for each person. So they, so everybody had the same supplies. So uh, regardless of what kind of creative creativity they come from, they would all have uh, materials they could work with. And um, I, I appreciated the people that participated because nobody had any idea what I was gonna have them do. And uh, 
I one thing that everyone is doing, um, either I have connected them or they have connected on their own, uh, someone who is geographically on the other side of the earth from them. And through because of Zoom and or Skype or any of these ways we can connect, they're going to interview the person for about 20 minutes and then do a portrait of them. And they can do it in whatever way they want. But um, sometimes they know these people. They met them maybe a year ago when they traveled or something. And then some of them they really only know because um, I've connected them. Suvant, I mean, Kim, so, we're going to need to, so I could, you, we could listen to you for an, a whole hour. And that's something oh, I Oh, yeah, no, you no, should. No, no, I, I want to say to all the artists, we could benefit and each adore having a half hour, 45 minutes with each person, but we want to sort of get the composite. So uh, I don't know, are people able to hear the little crystals that we have going off or not? Okay. So, um, Sivan, oh, jump in too, no, as we sorry. know. It, no, 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 this is perfect. Kim also deserves it because Kim is the co-founder of this exhibition. It's a try, it was a conversation between Suvan, myself, and Kim that launched this exhibition. So she is totally in the DNA of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Appreciate that. And we will move on. Uh, our next artist is Mariona Barkas. She, her work is be directly below Kim's in this image. And um, uh, Mariona, uh, I wonder if you'll share with us a story about what inspired you to do this piece that you're still working on about underground storage of nuclear waste. Okay, can you see me? Can you see me? Yes. I can't see anybody. Anyway, um, yeah, so basically, yes, thank, before I start, I want to say um, thanks to everybody and what a great show and, and I really appreciate being part of it. Uh, yeah, so what happened, I'm, this, this image, this, the print in it, is part of my ongoing series called Illustrated History, which I've been working on since like 1981, and it's an a ongoing contemporary chronicle of, of issues that I think have an impact for the future. So, um, and I, I read the newspapers and I clip and I save and I try to figure out what is going to be a future problem. Uh, so I came across this article um, about the Yucca Mountain nuclear repository, uh, actually a nuclear dump, and they were looking for an image that um, could be read by future civilizations like um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years into the future because that's the, the life of these, this nuclear waste. So I thought about that and I thought, well, that really belongs to my illustrated history. And I thought, what would be a perfect um, thing that would communicate with future generations? And I thought, well, the, uh, the society and everything will be so different, the languages, everything will be different, but we will still be humans and we'll have certain bodily functions. So I came upon the idea of a giant turd as an image and actually i sent off to the to the people who were organizing this and and i never heard back from them um so once i got that turd i also had a file full of of uh clippings about nuclear waste um that i've been keeping since like 1988 and i um thought well oh perfect i'll make some new uh toilet paper and i'll encapsulate the um articles that I had the clippings about nuclear waste um, in this glazine and then perforate it and it'll look exactly like toilet paper. And so I began to collect and I've collected since then. And actually for this show, I added on the last uh, 15 years. So I had been clipping and uh, added onto the glazine, encapsulated in a way that's kind of mimics the idea of, of encapsulating this nuclear waste. And I want to point out that um, this giant turd image, my turd image, was in 1995, which predated the uh, smiley little turd that you have on your cell phone. <laughs> so, as usual, I was ahead of the time, of the, my time. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Appreciate that. That's good. <laughs> nice to be able to laugh at some of our most frightening things. Okay. 
our next artist is um, Mary, uh, excuse me, is Sharon Barnes. Um, hers is the passport piece that you see in the middle at the bottom row, uh, and, and next to it is an open image from the same work. Um, Sharon, can you talk to us about this very personal connection that you have that made you create this work? Oh, thank you, Sivan. Actually, it's the piece um, at the top on the right. What did I do? Mix the artist. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, well, if you're going to screw up, screw up in the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to show in common ground. It's certainly um, an important topic. And the piece up at the, the right hand is called Milkman's Flight. And it is uh, gleaned from a novel by Toni Morrison uh, called Song of Solomon. And in it, there's a character called uh, Milkman. And he's a very conflicted character, partly because he had lost uh, ancestral memory and connections to uh, knowing his father's names. It was something really interesting because as I said upon, upon uh, doing my own gene, 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 genealogy and finding my forefathers' names, how grounded I felt once I had discovered them. And I think of displacement, uh, the violence of displacement from original lands and the loss of ancestral uh, memories have been so important to be regained. And the figure is flying uh, because uh, of West African folklore that Africans could fly. And uh, finding my own flying Africans was important for me to find ground. And I think that in understanding that we individually need to find our own ground and our connections to earth and place uh, are important as we seek to buy, build um, common ground with others uh, because it's in that shared understanding and compassion that we're able to find those connections with each other. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and this piece is made of such interesting materials as well. Uh, was that part of what you're thinking? Yes, it's, it's made of tar paper. And I've been working with tar paper uh, for the metaphors that it, uh, okay. it, it leads. And it's a very lightweight material that, um, you know, when you make it for a suspended work, it kind of lends itself both uh, in reality, it's not that, you know, heavy, uh, gives it a certain lightness that- um, Well, it's isn't... half the way you've used it, yes, certainly. <laughs> Thank you, it's beautiful. Thank you. Our next artist is Pilar Castillo, and it's her work that's passport at the bottom. Uh, I apologize for getting that screwed up. I couldn't be nervous or anything, could I? Because like, this is my first one of these. Anyway, Pilar, would you like to describe your passport and would you consider it a document of entry or a documentation of exclusion? Well, they go both hand in hand. Um, the passport functions as a symbol of power and exclusion. It gives people a sense of belonging in exchange for their obedience. In the eyes of the law, it is not enough to be human. You have to be a subject of the state. And if your status is illegal, then your entire personhood is in violation. The US passport is an institution that guards a distorted view of its own national identity, perpetuating the erasure of both the indigenous and the contributions of people of color. I started the passport project in the fall of 2019 as a direct response to the humanitarian crisis at the US-Mexico border and the brutality by the Trump administration toward the migrant caravan. The pilgrimage for refuge and asylum was an act of courage and desperation. It led to a confrontation between the impoverished masses and a world superpower. 
and no, the borders did not come down, but the impact left a crack in the armor of the USA and precipitated the course of events that led us to this revolutionary moment where Black Lives Matter is critical and people power is central. The Passport Project is in essence a confrontation. It is a work of protest and indignation that challenges the authenticity and questions the authority of the official document. Instead of romanticizing a colonial past, this counter narrative recalls a history of slavery and exploitation of the indigenous from reservations to cotton plantations, boarding schools and internment camps and the ongoing exploitation of migrant laborers and domestic workers. And ultimately for this very reason, as a daughter, as a Central American woman and a daughter of a domestic worker that came to the United States um, is precisely the reason why I had to respond in this way um, to what was happening at the border. It felt very personal to me, to my family, and I wanted to be able to use um, my skills and my talent towards making a statement, making a work of protest that would mark this period in time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pilar. And uh, I encourage everyone who has not already gone on the website, when we're done, go through and take a look at uh, Pilar's video. It's, it's beautiful and you really get uh, a wonderful sense of, of what it looks like. And uh, coming up with that video, I think is really going to give that work legs. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you too. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sandra so she can mess up with her five artists. <laughs> Erin, can you uh, move us forward? Great. So um, our first artist is Danielle Eubank. And um, some of you may know that Danielle, um, for many years, has had a project um, one artist, Five Oceans, and the Antarctica print, which is shown here, both in its fullness at the top right, one of them, the top left rather, and then both of them are together in an installation shot below. Um, I Often I've seen Danielle's work in terms of paintings, but these are photographs. And I thought of your, pro as a project, but this is going to surprise her because that's not what I sent. Um, as a, as in some ways, it's a very personal pilgrimage filled with feelings. And you've said that it, the sea as common ground and wherever you want to go with this would be great, Danielle. Thank you, yeah. And I uh, reiterate what some of the other people have said. I am so excited and so honored to be part of this exhibition. Thank you. It's very a very very important topic and i love hearing everybody's views i'm really enjoying hearing you all um yeah the the ocean is absolutely a common ground shared amongst all really all living things i mean when we were kids we were taught that or we learned that the ocean is 70 percent of the earth right all the oceans are connected. The way that we divided them up, there are five oceans. It's sort of arbitrary, and it's it's um, uh, something that's been debated and argued about a lot of times. But there's no denying that all of these giant bodies of water are connected, and as we are connected, it is something that is common amongst all of us. Did you know that the ocean produces over half of the world's oxygen? Right? So it isn't just humans, it's all living things. Um, even those people who are not anywhere near the ocean are hugely affected by the ocean or the sea, right? Um, we use the sea for, to create products that fight cancer. We use it to produce products that fight um, arthritis, arth uh, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease. So it has a very human-centric interest. Additionally, just in this country alone, did you know that our U.S. ocean economy produces, uh, this is a number I can't even get my head around, $282 billion in goods and services? So that takes it way beyond being an environmental thing and into something that's just good for everybody. The U.S. ocean uh, dependent businesses employ three million people. So tell that to your Congress people, <laughs> right? And that's just this country. 
And then if you multiply that times everywhere else in the world, it's, it's, it's well, it's very important. Um, and then, and then another Danielle, way. Danielle, we, that was your two minutes, so quickly. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I, I love what you're saying, and I could go on forever, but thank you. That's fine. We're well connected by the ocean. <laughs> we are. It's a wonderful sea. Thank you. Um, our next artist is Samantha Fields who has two of her newer paintings in the exhibition. Um, and Sam, can you say something about um, the smoke and, and I want to say spaghetti, I said confetti, um, in, in these recent works? Sure, hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm talking into the void here on the, on the Zooms. Um, yeah, so the confetti comes from, you know, my work, for the last 20 years has dealt with uh, personal, political, and ecological disaster. Uh, and since the election in 2016, uh, I started making work more on the political side, but I feel like all these things kind of conflate, right? Like the climate crisis is a political crisis. It is a personal crisis. It is a familial crisis. You know, it, it operates on all of those levels. Uh, so I wanted to create images that, um, that that talked about the dissonance I was feeling um, here in the US. And I started creating, I call these kind of constructed landscapes or constructed spaces. So all my past work, I had uh, gone out into the landscape and I was photographing and then I would make work pulled from my own photographs. But for these, uh, I made most of the work on the scanner and then I would combine what I did on the scanner uh, with photographs. So I brought here, I have props. So I brought, this is an image of um, the airplane. I have a little model airplane I use for these on the scanner with confetti. And then I would use that as the basis for the paintings. Um, so this plummeting airplane that you see here, it's kind of, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels is not sustainable. So the airplane is plummeting. It's like one of our biggest footprints is air travel. And then the confetti references both shrapnel, um, debris and also celebration. And so that dissonance I was talking about was really like the, the dissonance between the people now who are celebrating, um, some of them are on the White House lawn right now, and uh, the people who are in, um, in crisis and in revolution and working towards a better world. So that's really where this work all came from. It's part of a larger series uh, called American Dreams that's kind of about the, the collapse of that construct. So that's where all of this came from. But the confetti is I use real confetti for it, so it's all over the studio. <laughs> it's a mess. That's great. You have a bit, a, a bit of scattered ground there. That's great. <laughs> Very cool. So our, our next artist is um, Eloisa Guanmal. It's the beautiful canoe that you'll see in the two installation shots. And it's made of rice paper. And I'm wondering, it's a very strong vessel as metaphor. And I'd really love to have her, and yet it's very fragile. And I'd really love to have her speak on, you know, this fragility and yet its strength as a, both a, a metaphor and where it stands for her, for her in her own series of artworks. Thank you for that question, Sandra. Um, and also, first I wanted to thank Sandra and Suvan for organizing this really important show um, and all the topics that we're covering. And also to echo Pamela, I would also like to acknowledge the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral land I am Zooming from. <laughs> so with that too, and in terms of fragility, um, well, the canoe really speaks to the idea of displacement also. And when we think of the idea of um, the theme of common ground, we are in this um, collective experience right now of being in quarantine and that's our common ground. But at the same time, that common ground has its inequities, you know, um, where people are displaced politically, economically, and socially in terms of where you are in the social and economic chain of the United States. So, but going back to the theme of the canoe and the idea of displacement and um, fragility, I look at um, the colonial context of um, where I am now 
and where people are living um, on island nations and also, um, you know, indigenous peoples. And um, so Sandra was talking about metaphor. The canoe is a metaphor for that kind of displacement and also fragility of home uh, in terms of um, rising seawaters and all of that. And also the fragility of um, materials, you know, of the materials that we own. Right now I said that I recognize the Kumeyaay people and we're renting this beach house that is supposedly owned by someone, right? But once upon a time, the Kumeyaay thrived and had families here. And now they've been displaced and mostly forgotten by the people who live here now. Um, so there's all those kind of layers that I, I explore in my artwork. And then finally, in terms of material, I use um, rice paper because I think that the message has to be hand in hand with the art material that I'm using. And so um, a decade ago, I decided that I didn't want to use materials that are archival, that um, it has to be materials that definitely biodegrade really fast and go back to earth. And that's ephemeral, um, that no one can own, just like thank the earth. You. Thank you, Eloisa. Appreciate that. Beautiful. Um, our next artist is Anne Azolda, and um, Layers is a really wonderful way to consider her work that focuses in many ways, initially at least, on climate change. And uh, her most recent uh, painting, uh, Planet, Planet in Peril at the top, at the center, is, um, became the card for the exhibition. And Annie, I'm wondering if you can talk about the combination of the simple shapes and the mix of it seems to me there's a, a journey here from a alert to also some sense of peace and hope in yours as much as it is in peril. Um, go for it, girl. <laughs> Sandy on? If you unmute yourself and speak, that would be great. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Thank you, Sandra and um, Subhan. I am thrilled to be part of this show with so many wonderful, amazing activists, women artists. Um, it brings me much joy. And uh, I want to say that I share your concerns about what's happening on our common ground. And I've been an avid environmentalist ever since Earth Day. <laughs> and I wanna give a shout out to the SCWC Eco Art Collective that I was a member of for like over, we put on four exhibitions over a period of time, and they were inspirational in me going in this direction. Um, and so the, the, the painting below I did in 2009, because I was getting very concerned about, you know, the water rising and the planet heating up, and the green in the middle is a pressed paint that represents the earth that's still trying to, struggling to survive in spite of all this. It's like a house within a house. And the smaller house is the, is the earth, but the bigger house is the industrial military complex that's got uh, silver and, and concrete, things like that. And, but I, I placed it in an environment that's, cos that's like in the cosmos, where there's the sun and the moon, and then the, the, the cosmos is a cathedral, because we uh, have been allowed to, to live on this planet, which is a, an incredible jewel there may not be any other one like it. And so um, I finished that painting. And then when this show came around, I'd started this other painting, but I didn't get it done for a show it was supposed to be in. And I thought, I'm gonna just work on it. And uh, the thing that was really interesting was it started out a certain way. And then the painting started telling me, no, 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 you gotta do that. Like the green, there was not green in the background, but I had to, when I put the COVID, images in I had to you know cover up some mistakes and so I started I'll just put some green there and then I when I put the green there I went oh my god it's the greenhouse gases and then I was looking this planet it has it's a pressed paint so it has the, there's veins on it that are raised that I painted orange so they look like they're catching on fire and uh, you could touch it and feel the surface and that the idea is that is the planet submerging into the ocean? Is the ocean rising to cover up the planet? Um, you know, and, and then above, that strip above, I had painted a red bar and put a blue-green 
um, glaze on it. And as the glaze dried, it just sort of came up like a curtain. And I thought, oh my God, that blue green is our forest. They, they're a carbon sink. They give us oxygen and the veil is starting to lift and you can see all the fires behind it. So that's Thank you, Yeah, that's Thank it. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we're so glad it's on our announcement. It's a beautiful image. Thank you. Um, Meg Madison, um, this wonderful print that uh, you have created with the plant, with the yucca plant and with the natural elements um, on a piece of land that you homestead, could you share sort of both your, your collaboration literally in making the, the, the print, but also I think relative to what we're hearing today, your experience as someone who has, who has property that has been homesteaded would be really interesting to hear. Meg? Perchance we'll come back. There, oh, she is. there we are, sorry about that. Thank you so much. I um, didn't know I was speaking, that's kind of great. Um, thank you, Sandra and Suvan and Erin and anyone else who helped you there at a toolbox and uh it's a it's a great space and it's i mean i'm there's so many wonderful artists here you know that i know and don't know and it's great to be here with you um you know i really appreciated the you starting with pamela peters um and you know making some kind of reference to the land because it, it is, um, that is something I've come to feel very much. I bought a piece of property in the desert, kind of like really on, on, a, on a whim almost, you know. Um, um, my mom had died and she always did kind of crazy things. And I went out to the desert like without my spouse and, you know, bid on something without even telling them. And, you know, it was just kind of like, you know, you, you, it was it was all kind of crazy but once i was there i started making these um i wanted to document all the different mojave desert plants on the five acres and i was very like romanticized the whole idea of homesteading really appealed to me that people should be given you know to use a five acre parcel and they had to improve it and then of course you know even though i know like i'm right next to public land that obama made a monument um and i knew it was a sacred spot for the serrano people mm -hmm. but you know then like one day like it's just amazing how something just hits you in the head and you go like wait a second homesteading i mean this is stolen land you know and 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 that's true everywhere we are it's it's um it's kind of really a brutal and savage past that that undermines us and while i think all of these things we're talking about were important and they all happened like before this year this year has made all of these ideas more important and especially everything about land how we have any kind of ownership of land that we're not using and taking care of is bizarre and, and the economic fallout from the pandemic and the displaced people, it's just, I mean, everybody's been touching on all the same kind of things. Thank so, you, Meg, that's very good. Thank you very much. Sivan, go forward. Uh, okay, um, back to me and the next image. Um, and I really love hearing everybody talk about their work and appreciate all the, th the thank yous, but uh, we've got to say ours to you because obviously the show wouldn't exist without your wonderful work. And we're totally grateful to have you uh, as part of our uh, common ground exhibition. So uh, the next person up is Karu Mansour. And um, she's uh, the image that's, in the middle on the far right, the two yellow images stacked. This, can you see them? Okay, Karu, um, I, when you can get, get up close to these, you can actually see that the surface has this aged look, like it's, it's cracked and it's got these lines that go partway across it or 
they look like start out like telephone lines and then they just sort of break up. And I wonder if you'd talk to us a little bit about the uh, what all that represents to you. Are you on there? I don't think she is. Oh, I saw her. I thought I saw her earlier. No, Karu? Well, in that case, I will just say a couple of words about these images. Karu has traveled extensively across the country. And one of the things that she noticed was the landscape and how it changed. And the changes in the landscape held her attention. And it tied to something that was both very personal, but also old, something very old. And we actually didn't get into a lot of detail, so I'd like to give you more, but I hope that you will go and look at the close-ups of these images. They're absolutely starting, startlingly beautiful and look um, very much like ancient uh, paintings, although they're not. So I'll go on then to the next person. And she's also not with us, but she knew she wouldn't be, so she let me know. And that's Mary Rose Mendoza. Now on the far left in the corner, you'll see this gigantic globe. And that's the title of it, Globe. And um, Mary Rose is a native of the Philippines. And the global world she's giving us is part soccer ball, part, uh, what do you call those things? Hawaiian shirt, part um, something, something always light, played for the lightness of it, right? And yet for her, this is um, things that have been imported around the world that change, uh, change identity and culture. So her piece has a, a two-edged sword. And I encourage you to get a chance to read her statement and uh, enjoy the piece because it's really quite amazing. And it's, it's large. I mean, we're talking something, what is it like? For me, it would be well above waist high. Okay, um, next person up is Sandra Mueller. Sandra's is the piece down at the bottom uh, with the three images in it, the two birds and the uh, sweeper. Can you talk to us a little bit about what these figures represent for you, Sandra? Well, um, as you might surmise by the central figure, um, the fellow the temple sweeper who is quite wonderful to me that he's clad in a palette uh, to what is actually found in nature. Um, they are glimpses from a, a, a travel to India um, seven years ago that like probably most people's travels to India was much of as much of not organized as a pilgrimage but it was a pilgrimage and the two birds um on the side are um you know they're the, that part of their it's called morning chores but they're what they're doing is taking care they're taking care of themselves um they're nourishing um they're resting as they were um and I just, you know, found so often for myself in travel that it is the natural places that give us that, and that sense of land, um, a glimpse of where we are. Um, and then I, I love, and a photographer friend of mine pointed out, because I often just sort of in finding things that will go for a show, do some samples and they, they land on the floor next to each other. And that's kind of what happened with the birds were intentional, but the fellow sort of was um, joined in. And he's a different perspective and all this, but he's doing the work that we, you know, you have a sense of, you don't know that he is a temple sweeper, but he is. Um, and what the thing I felt about, especially with the birds, but it would relate to him as well. I didn't know whether the birds, when I went to write about this piece, I began to think, well, are they transitory? Are they migratory? Are they permanent? So um, anyhow, that's, um, they each have a stance and especially those that are of nature. Um, and I think they bring us to a closer feeling of nature. Thank you. And look, we see him with a bird's eye view. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're in full portrait mode and he's where he's squeezed in between them i think that's sort of suitable don't you <laughs> yeah um our next artist is nada osling oops we just lost the screen i'm not sure why i'm sorry I'm sure. everybody give me one second i knew there would be something right of course there has to be something yeah Sorry, hold on. I know Erin will help. Uh, well, she's doing that. We'll just say that our next artist up is Nada Osling. And hers is the uh, Gringotopia image that you saw uh, in the middle of this screen. And once we get it back, uh, we can talk about it. Well, I can go ahead and talk about it anyway. I mean, okay. I don't know that the image actually completely describes the project, but. Um, um, yeah, so um, so thank you everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you, Suvan and Sandra. Um, I'll just l mention the project and I know you had a question which was... Um, Anna, go for it. Yeah, okay. So over a period of two years, I went to Chapala, Mexico, which is about an hour bus ride from Guadalajara. And while I was there, I did video interviews with a total of 25 people, um, and most of whom were expats from the US and Canada. Um, our conversations were, they're both serious and humorous, um, and they were about certainly cultural borders, um, but they focused on, on, I'll just read some of these things, uh, cultural differences, motivations for leaving the U.S., who's considered a gringo, the meaning of manana, misunderstandings in language, economic inequality, bargaining, tipping, safety, fear, crime, guns, the cartel, Mexican justice, cross-cultural romance, priorities, smoking pot, the border, value systems, returning to the states, healthcare, dying, and more. Um, and so I collected over 40 hours of material, and from that I broke the material into sections that are woven together with the pacing of a, of a social conversation. Um, the end project became Gring Gringotopia, which is a series of 12 10 minute videos. Um, and what I found is something that contradicts the internalized myth of America as the best place in the world to live. Um, this particular community, because there's a lot of expats throughout the world, this is known as a retirement um, community for the most part. And a huge motivating factor was economic for people to move there. A lot of people just simply could not afford to live in the United States anymore. And it wasn't just the cost of overall living, but it was most specifically healthcare. Um, and, and a lot of people came from colder climates, so they were just sort of over that experience. Um, but I think more significantly that after they relocated and after the newness of the experience wore off and they weren't on vacation anymore, Many of them really began to see the values of the US that focuses on materialism, competition, and rampant um, con uh, consumerism and, um, uh, and capitalism. They didn't really work for them anymore. Um, and it's a global phenomenon. I think many people of all ages leave the US for a better way of life. Um, I think on an existential level, many people that leave the country, they're un increasingly uncomfortable with what this country has come to represent to the world. Thank you, Nita. And I just want to let you know that I heard from one person that she watched all of them. <laughs> all of them. She sat down and watched them all. It's, they're Thank beautiful you. videos. They're really well put together. And I hope everybody will go in and take a look at them. Thanks. Uh, just, our next artist up is I'm Pamela P. Just to confirm real quick, you all can see the screen again, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Erin, for sorting that out. Um, our next artist is Pamela Peters, and uh, her piece is up at the top on the right, uh, the one that's two black and white photographs. Pamela, um, is there anything special you'd like us to think about? You mentioned the psychological effects of uh, the Native people moving or being um, it's it's actually not the psychological effect of moving it's more of the image that people perceive of us as indigenous native american people but um first okay. of all i just want to say thank you to susan and savan and all the organizers along with the other artists who were able to put um common ground the exhibition together um the two images i have part of the show are from my legacy of exile indians series um, I'm just going to go over a little bit about the series. Um, I know I have two minutes, so I'm going to just jump right into it. Okay, the series gives a glimpse into one of the many culture, cultural histories of American Indians' migration to metropolitan major cities. 
This one in particular was structured by the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs that was also in, and was also influenced by the 1961 film The Exiles, a neorealism film that documented the realistic imagery of American Indians going through the BIA, U.S. government relocation program, and one of the cities was here in Los Angeles, California. All my participants within, in the images are from various tribes. There are, there are Navajos, Cherokee, Seminole, Barona Bands of Mission Indians, and Lakota. They all have also migrated to the cities off their reservation in the course of their own lives, or a few of them are um, second, th second and third generations from families that relocated from the US BIA relocation program from back in 1956. This, pro this photo film project showcases young adults of today paying tribute to the first generation of relocated Indians from that era. The photos, the photo narratives have many layers and I'll address four critical ones. I'll address only four critical ones for today. Um, first of all, it's time and place. It's the history of American Indians in contemporary times, not in a relic past existence or as our, we are not viewed as objects in order to be objectified. And then the images are how we as a Native Americans are structured visually, visu visu visually in historical narratives and in modern attire not as what we have been seeing in Western movies as a relic one-dimensional object that once again is objectified. And then Los Angeles landscape. I took these images as part of the city that has a deep history of working class migrants that for generation has been pushed further off the sites of downtown Los Angeles who continue and actually when I took this photos um, the city downtown has changed tremendously. It's gone through another different cycle of gentrification in downtown Los Angeles. And then lastly, it's my visual sovereignty as a Navajo photographer. I shoot portraits to create video vignettes of people that illustrate us as multi-dimensional human beings with voices, with modern images. We are not seen as objects and are placed in structured narratives vastly seen of Indians that still continue to be seen today, as you can see in mascots, as you can see in relic storytelling to um, young, young kids in school. Um, so that's really what my, my work is about. Um, Pamela, that's I also, fantastic. Oh, am I done? You are done. Oh, I'm <laughs> I mean, sorry. Done. Okay, we can keep going, but we probably need okay. to pause if you would. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to say, just I just hope this project will help foster a better understanding of who we are, the differences, despite our cultural ties that we as American Indians have offered, an accurate portrayal of Indian life and tribal identity that st that we still sustain even in an urban city like Los Angeles. Wow. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Last up in this grouping. We have Sheila Pinkle. Sheila's work is the one you see in the left-hand corner. Um, Sheila, uh, can you tell us a little bit about this print, which you call Transformative Justice, and maybe something about your panel discussion on the 21st? Sure. Um, um, thank you so much. This has really been a marvelous experience in every way. Um, this um, image came about because um, for the last 20 years, I've been working on criminal justice um, um, artworks and um, in the process have been realizing that there's usually a dichotomy between the criminal and the victim and and but when you actually start looking at that subject um, the, each person has their own story their own narrative that is crucial um, um, in the process of healing to understand what that is so I came up with the slogan every person is a universe and put it in the context of a universe um, and it's really appropriate to go um, after the last speaker because um, and when I looked at indigenous um, justice systems transformative justice is integral to those systems where um, somebody calls a, a meeting um, of people who are having problems and so um, the first step is they're working out um, some kind of restitution which I have on the left and then um, from that um, there's healing uh, which is at the top and then um, reconciliation on the right side and then 
Um, and typically what that is, is that the, the people are in a circle and um, the two people um, having um, difficulties are in the middle um, with a facilitator and surrounded by their parents and members of the community who support them so that they're not excommunicated from the community um, in this dialogue, but the, the community supports them um, if they need help. And so then, um, so if um, somebody needs um, help in order to create um, restitution, somebody from their family um, pipes up and says they're going to help them. But then the last word at the bottom, which is quite visible here, is community, where the community might say, well, you know, you're not supposed to steal. However, we as a community know that there are times when people are in need. So what can we do as a community in order to be able to help people so that they don't have to steal. So this is in my work about transformative justice and, and about um, how to dignify every person um, so that we don't, um, uh, so we create a true community of understanding. Um, um, so I'm having a, a, a panel discussion in a couple of weeks um, with community leaders who, whose focus is creating community in different ways. Lovely, thank you, Sheila. Really good. Now, we're Sandra, it's your turn to take over. Very cool. And there we are. Um, wrong one. Uh, can we have the overall, Erin? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, in the upper um, right are two images by Sanan um, Ravel. And um, they each are part of a series, the Doppel, Doppelganger series. And she has a unique way of spelling this um, when she writes it. But I'm wondering if, uh, Sanan, you can talk about your process. And it's, I think, also with our focus on land, um, the fact that you were newly arrived in the States when, this, when you made these. Um, that would be terrific. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Sandra and Sivan, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Thanks so much for including my work, um, and I'm very um, honored to be part of this uh, wonderful group. Um, I did want to say that doppelganger was, has two meanings. The photographs uh, have myself as all the people in it. So that really came from my, um, I guess, my personal background as a um, Taoist, Buddhist, Chinese. So I wanted to um, put myself in the picture as every person. Um, but first of all, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about my history, which was that I, my family, um, uh, escaped from China in, um, and fled to Australia. And um, I've always realized that I could have been one of the many nameless millions of people caught in China. And then when I moved to LA in the 90s, I saw at first hand the, the Rodney King LA riots and um, the disposable attitudes of this a very uh, consumer oriented society. And also um, following that, the Iraq war in 2001. So I created a whole lot of double anger um, portraits because it's uh, one thing to have thoughts and prayers, but as artists, we share the common ground of the earth, the air, the water, fire, all the elements, the five elements, we share the common ground of our ideals and ideas. And the ground is also our medium, which is art, I presume, you know, in whatever form. Um, so, um, I'm on. Yeah. That's actually your time. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everyone realized that I am all these people because we, we have the capacity to be all of those. 
Why don't you name, provide the titles and then we'll move, move along because I think oh, uh, the top one is um, World News um, and this, the bottom one is Border Patrol showing um, an immigrant held at gunpoint by a vigilante. Okay, great. So um, we're going to play around a little, we're going to stay on this screen so we'll come back We'll skip the rest of the alphabetical order and we have two collaborative pieces that we'll come back to later. Um, our next artist is Linda Viejo, who um, is chairing our next panel on social political images, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think these are a prime example. And they're from her Brown Dot Adobe series. And Linda, um, go in whatever direction you feel that you'd like to speak on this work from how you construct them to their meanings around inclusion exclusion okay let's see do you see me Side by side. oh good i can't see myself um first i want to say thanks to toolbox for putting together the show it looks absolutely wonderful i know how much it takes to install a show with so many artists and it just is a beautiful installation of course, I want to thank SCWCA and Sandra and Sivan for all their hard work. I know how much details there are involved in putting together a show like this. In regards to the panel that's coming up, it's, uh, it includes uh, Naida Oslin and Pamela J. Peters, Mariana Barkas and Pilar Castillo and myself. And the title is, What Inspires Artists to Create Socio-Political Images and Why Are These Images Important? I hope that you'll join us on Wednesday and uh, Hopefully, have a very good discussion about uh, the reason why we're making socio-political image and why it's important in our lives. Um, I have four pieces in this show, and they're all a part of a series called uh, the Brown Dot Project, in which I I call them data pictographs, in which I use brown dots to represent data. In this case, uh, the piece below, which you can see most clearly, is uh, represents the fact that 38% of Latinos in Los Angeles own their own home. I do a. I took a photograph, uh, or actually, um, I collected a fo an antique photograph of the adobe in Los Angeles County and uh, changed its color and uh, superimposed a grid on top of it, which you can see in yellow. Then I drew a box on top of that, counted the number of squares in that box, and let's say that there's a thousand uh, squares in that box. Then thir 380 of them would be dotted brown to represent the data that 38% of Latinos in Los Angeles County own their own home. Each one of these pieces, as you can see on the top four, uh, represent data about Latinos. 15.7% 15, 15 of Los Angeles uh, uh, West Side community is Latino. 38% of Latinos in Los Angeles own their own home, as I said. 16% of California DACA recipients also own their own home. And lastly, 94% of current DACA recipients born in Mexico uh, and Central America and South America in 2017. Uh, the Brown Dot Project is a part of a much larger series of work that I've been working on for the last 10 years called Make Them All Mexican, uh, which I focus uh, uh, all the work on what it means to be Latino in the United States today. I'm a third generation Californian uh, with parents from Texas and Mexico. Um, and the work is really about how we see ourselves, how other people see us, and what the reality is of our lives, and what we have contributed to American society and American culture. And most recently, a lot of my data has to do with the gross uh, national product. Uh, the the US Latinos constitute the seventh largest economy in the world. And uh, there's a lot of data that needs to be shared so that we can learn and uh, learn about ourselves, teach other people about who we are, improve our lives and uh, feel good about some of the contributions that we've made and also understand some of the challenges that we face and the, um, the uh, work that we need to do to be able to get ahead. Thank you very much. That's great. And then the last um, artist that's on this screen, she's um, also another person unable to be here today. Um, it's Gail Warner's work um, that's down in the installation shot the three wonderful um, bird paintings and prints. Um, and for her, she too is uh, an in, uh, indigenous person and that the animals and birds and plants share the land. 
um, and they are considered to be people and their stories of migration parallel the migration of the birds. And it's quite wonderful because right to the left of it also is the uh, NIDA's um, uh, Gringotopia for the expats video. Um, and then uh, the homestead print from uh, Meg Madison, and then uh, a, a glimpse of, of my work with the birds. So hers, um, she's an exquisite painter and, um, you know, well worth spending time with um, in either in person or the virtual gallery. So Erin, um, can you cue us to the, the first one, the She Votes, go back one, that would be great. One more. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, a collaborative um, community art project of the Southern California Women's Caucus for Art, organized and created by Bonnie J. Smith, who is with us. And um, it was this exhibition, uh, let me just frame this. We were well aware that 2020 before COVID was a significant year for women. It was the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. It was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and it was we knew it would be an involved election. So this one focuses on that 100th anniversary. Bonnie, would you go forward? Bonnie, are you on? I sure am. Hey, good. I've had the idea of the She Votes book for about 10 years. I presented to the board of Southern California Women's Caucus for Art, and they gave me the green light, and I was off and running with my idea. 69 artists gave me 113 original four by six, six artworks, and those all arrived through the mail. And the artists at first were expressing their thoughts and feelings about the centennial of the 19th Amendment. What I noticed soon was that some artworks were becoming more about our current political, social justice climate, and specifically to women's rights issues. Once I received all the artworks, they were placed into the altered book in the order they were received by me. The flow of the book demonstrates the progression of social justice thoughts over the five months I received artworks. Many days, I would be overwhelmed that so many members answered my call, trusted me with their original art. It has been my honor to create this book for them, as this is our community project. And I just want to thank you <clears throat> for asking to have the book in the exhibit. Well, it's, it's very important because it all wraps up to, you know, part with common ground as we need to make change and shift. Voting is a very key instrument. So that was really an important tie in. So let's go to stitch in time, if we might. Well, before we do, I just wanted to tell Bonnie that that image of uh, Susan B. Anthony, that, that particular uh, image, uh, came to me today from someone who clipped it and sent it to everyone they knew in the Sierra Club's uh, environmental justice group wow. uh, to remind people to vote. Uh, Susan's exact image? No, that postcard. That postcard. Oh. Okay, great. Cool. So we had another, that one had 69 artists from across the country. And this one is a project organized by my co-curator, Suvan Gear, that has um, 24 artists and 30 panels. And um, its title is Stitch in Time. Um, Suvan, if you would, you know, speak to us of just sort of a bit of a description, but also make sure you share about the panel that you're hosting um, next Saturday. Um, that would be great. Okay. Um, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> this got started uh, at the beginning of last, of be back in January, because um, there was so much going on, but it was all focused around just, you know, we knew there was going to be uh, an election. We knew that the 
climate change was going. We knew that we didn't know about the pandemic yet. It hadn't quite hit, but already it felt like there was some kind of social change. And yet this was the anniversary year of Earth Day. This was the anniversary of women. So I kind of sent out word and I asked women to give me uh, a square. It didn't have to be a square. It could be any size, any shape that captured what they were feeling uh, going into this year. And we met in a series of uh, Zoom calls it turned into. We were going to do it in galleries and homes and that to have these sort of coffee clutches and little sewing circles. And it turned into something virtual. Uh, but what came out of it were these wonderful images that sort of go to all these things that run through our mind, that go to the, uh, the political stuff, that go to the social stuff, that go to all these things. And in this image, I think you can see that uh, in the, on the side there, um, it turned into a crazy quilt, literally a crazy quilt. You've got Bless This Mess, mess by Nancy Spiller, and um, picture of the White House. You've got the response of one artist, um, uh, Darlene Martin, who said, it's amazing how many worries are lost while gardening because so many found that going into nature was the place that they could be renewed and actually find a little bit of wholeness. Uh, you have um, uh, the portrait of, of the president uh, that he's wearing this sort of mask with pins coming out of it uh, by Ann Golden. Uh, you have, there were so many responses that were all so personal and it's a delight to be able to mount this thing. It's huge and I, I really appreciate that we had enough room to be able to do it. On the floor there's a, a square, it's made out of cloth covered with reproductions of newspaper articles for the year and a large needle because it's a stitch in time and I'm a very literal person. There we go. So do you want to give a little plug for your panel? I'm just going to say that we're going to be talking about uh, um, next Saturday, uh, an unbalanced world. And um, at the moment, I'm too nervous to think of who else is in that. So please forgive me, but we'll look, we're, we're going through it at the very end and then you'll see everybody's. There. Right. Okay. So this, this is really super. This, um, concludes our formal tour. I'm thinking, Suvan, maybe what we do is we get the heads up from Aaron on how to visit the gallery. And if there's time to hang a little at the end, we can do that. But let's make sure we stay reasonably on folk time. Does that seem all right for you? Suvan? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to Aaron. That's yeah, that's fine. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, Aaron, why did, the the Aaron? Why don't you give us the uh, way to uh, bring us into the digital world that we can navigate the um, the online installation that you've made? Okay. Um, give me one second here. First of all, thank you, everybody, so 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 much for speaking. It's amazing to hear from all of you artists um, and thank you to everybody who joined us it is I'm gonna take this minute because I have I, I stopped the share screen and I have everybody on gallery view to take a picture of everybody is that <laughs> is that okay to do in this moment please um, on three one two three okay. Thank you so much. We have to document these things. This is our very first virtual opening and it was a lot of fun to go through. <laughs> um, so I am going to reshare my screen now and just show you all a little bit um, about getting through the virtual gallery. Do you see the web page? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so the URL is 1111acc.org forward slash common ground. Um, Addie, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat one more time, that would be wonderful. And, you know, it was really, really exciting after um, spending so much time kind of cooped up at home and having all of our um, all of our shows canceled, as you know, most galleries did, to be able to install this exhibit in person. I am so grateful that we were able to, um, and it just came together really, really beautifully. So here, um, if you would like to see the exhibit in person, 
we ask that you make an appointment using this link right here. Um, our gallery hours available for appointment only are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from about 11 to 5. So you can go ahead and sign up for your appointment time there. Um, and as everybody has been referencing the upcoming conversations, you can go ahead and RSVP for your upcoming, the upcoming events here. They are all virtual on Zoom. Um, and just go ahead and put in your name and email address, really self-explanatory, obviously. And once you hit submit, you are confirmed. You will not get an email right away that says you're confirmed, but trust me, it came directly to me. Um, so as you scroll down, you'll be able to really tour the exhibit. We did some um, 360 degree views of the gallery here where you can click around and view the space from multiple angles. Um, so definitely take advantage of that and go around the gallery and see everything as though you were there in person. It won't be quite as good, but close. Um, and then continue to scroll down. You'll see installation views in a little slideshow gallery. And then further, you'll see the list of the featured artists, their statements, their bios, um, the artwork information, and then of course the inquiry, purchase inquiry button. Um, so you can contact us through this web page if you are interested in purchasing anything. If you just have any further questions, please do. Please feel free to use this um, menu on the side here. And I wanted to give a quick shout out as we go down, down, down to our sponsors, um, the Southern California Women's Caucus for Art. Thank you so much. Department of Cultural Affairs Los Angeles supported this exhibit and ongoing program as well. And as Addie and I mentioned, we are 1111, a creative collective, um, nonprofit uh, arts organization based out of the San Fernando Valley, but working all over LA County. And we are housed at Toolbox LA. So if you would like any more information about our home facility, you can go ahead and click here and get some more info. Um, again, any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can contact us through the website and, you know, take a look at some of the other programs that we have going on, public art projects, events, all virtual now, um, ongoing programs and youth um, art workshops.